Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Lay's Real Talk. Good morning. Good evening. Happy Tuesday. Happy Wednesday. Uh, it's the start of the week, but it's already Tuesday. I can't believe it. Um, all right. How's everyone? I hope your start of the week is good. All right. We'll talk about India and China today. Um, excellent. I see I already have some questions for me. All right. Okay. Okay, so let me um, let me get started. I'll answer the questions at the end. Um, when you address questions to me, um, make sure you put my name at the front so I know it's addressed to me. There will be a lot of comments, and then sometimes I don't know which one is for me. All right, you know, recently um, United, the United Nations has uh, predicted that as of, I think it's April 14th, India's population uh, exceeded that of China. So technically, India is now the most populous country in the world, right? And um, actually, uh, India's GDP growth rate already exceeded uh, that of China as of uh, 2015. So the discussion, the talk of the elephant, elephant versus dragon competition has been ongoing since uh, 2015. Some people believe that India is on its path to catch up with China economically. Others don't believe it will happen because they argue that one, China's GDP is five to six times larger than India's because China's GDP last year was what, 17 billion, I mean, $17 trillion, and the India's is 3.5. So yeah, it's five or six times larger. And then uh, China's manufacturing productivity is higher than that of India. So some people don't believe it would happen. Now, I I think India is more competitive than China for a number of reasons and has the potential to overtake China to be the world's second largest economy. I know it's hard to convince you because right now, you know, it's people just don't believe that mathematically you can outgrow someone who is five to six times bigger than you. Uh, but hopefully, I'm, I'm just saying that India has a lot of potential to, to, to be able to do that. So I will compare China and India's competitiveness uh, in the below five areas. Demographics, workforce, uh, their economic models, and then social wealth, welfare, and governance and political system. Um, <clears throat> so first and foremost... China surpasses India in both total population and GDP growth. Uh, let's first talk about the uh, demographic advantage. So the medium age in India is 27 years old. It's 11 years younger than China's median age of 38. A third of India's population is under 18, the age of 18, while only one fifth um, of China's population falls into this age group. Now, again, China's data is based on its official census, which many believe isn't realistic. Um, but we have to use its official number, right, for, na for now. Um, China's population is aging rapidly at the same time, while birth, birth rate is declining dr drastically. Um, I'm not going to quote any official numbers about the, the decline in the birth rate. You ha probably already have seen media reporting that. There are other people talking about it. I don't like to quote those numbers because I know they're not accurate. So I'll share with you some other interesting data that give you um, kind of a snapshot of, of where China is in terms of its population growth. So according to... Um, data released by China's Ministry of Education at the end of March, there were a total of 149,000 primary schools in China last year, and it's down 35% in 10 years um, when compared to 20, 2012. Now, in terms of the reduction in primary schools, that's that's a lot, 35%. Um, because, because, because when you have primary schools that are already down, you know, so much, we have so fewer primary schools, that means your loss of population already started at least 10 years ago, right? Because you, you the kids go to primary school 
what, at age of six or seven, and then they graduate 12. So, so, so the fact that the schools are already down by so, so much means that this population decline started not just now as the media, as the media start to pick up, it has started a long time ago. Um, and recently we've seen kindergartens and, um, uh, you know, going out of business on large scale in China. So, for example, in 2022, 10,000 kindergartens and elementary schools in China were closed due to decline in the number of students or children. Um, and that's a lot. 10,000 kindergartens and schools. And Reuters reported that the online search volume for strollers, baby strollers in China's Baidu search engine dropped 17% last year, but it's 41% down since 2018. While the search volume for baby bottles dropped about by 33% during the same period. In contrast, the search volume for nursing homes last year skyrocketed eightfold. Um, <clears throat> More importantly, China's working age population has declined, has been declining since 2010. And between 2010 to 2020, the percentage of working age population uh, to total population dropped by 7% from 70% to 63%, while the proportion of elderly population increased by 5.4%. Um, and I, I want to show you a, a a graph. I actually do have graph. Um, oh, yeah, this is, maybe I'll, I'll talk about this. Actually, yeah, th this is the chart that shows the uh, average median age. You see how China, it's 38, and India is 27. And you see the, the distribution of population by age, where Whereas it's highly, you know, you know, it's loaded in the bottom, right? For India on the right, whereas in China, it's it's more, um, it's more in the higher in the old older age tiers. Um, <clears throat> what I want to show you is this chart. So the top right chart shows the working age population, um, the historical number, and also projection. Right, um, it has been going down. The peak was at 2010, it, and then it has been on a downward trend. Um, and in terms of the percentage, so the 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 red bars are the the absolute number of people, and then the the black line is the percentage. So you see, by 2060, China will almost like 50 a little over 50%, 55% of the people, uh, only 55% will be working age population. That's people between the age of um, 16 and, and 64. Yeah, 15, no, 15 and 64. So that will be dramatically reduced. Um, I think that that may arrive sooner than 2060. I think this is a very conservative um, estimate. But what's interesting is the declining workforce uh, is translated into the declining GTB growth. So if you compare the graph um, with the China's real GTB growth by decades, right? So they're both, the, the both, uh, the, the X axis are, are decades. It has the same, it has same bell shape, right? The, the peak was in the 2010s, yeah, and then it start to go down. Um, so as the working population decreases, China's GDP growth also decreases. Um, and so, so for example, China's GDP growth dropped from around uh, the highest, which was 10.6% in 2010, to 3% in 2022. Um, now, I, I even question that 3% because I don't believe China had any growth last year, given the scale and extent of the country's zero COVID lockdowns. Um, but, but my point is, as long as China's workforce continues to decline, the GDP contraction will continue. 
Now, um, let's talk about India's growth. India's real GDP growth in 2022 was 6.7%, higher than China's 3%. Uh, it's already the world's fifth largest economy. So in terms of U.S. dollars, um, let me turn this thing. In terms of U.S. dollars, India's um, no nominal GDP in 2022 reached about $3.4 trillion. It surpassed its former co colonial ruler, uh, the Great Britain, and it's approaching 80% of Japan's um, so for the for the past two years, Ch India has exceeded China's GDP growth, um, and the IMF has projected that China's economic growth uh, will both again be higher uh, this year and next year. And according to India's own central bank, uh, its economy is expected to surpass Germany by 2025 or 2026 and will surpass Japan's by 2027. Um, so that's only four years from now. So four years from now, India will become the world's third largest economy. So here's the big question. Will India take over China as the world's second largest economy? Um, between the second and third, there's a huge gap because Japan's GDP is about $5 trillion and China's Japan is the third, right, at five trillion dollars, and China at the at second is seventeen trillion. So there's no question that India will quickly catch up with Japan, but will they catch up with China at seventeen trillion? Well, I think India definitely has the potential for a number of reasons. First, the Chinese GDP is seriously overstated. There's no way China's GDP is at 17 trillion because it was at only 14 trillion before the pandemic in 2019. Has China recovered to the pre-pandemic state of its economic affairs? I do not think so. So there's no way it's at 17 trillion, right? At best, it's around 14 trillion. Now, China's real GDP is somewhere around $11 trillion dollars um, in 2015, and it was only at six trillion in 2010. Um, as I show you, China's work workforce started to decline in 2010. I re I really think that China's economy uh, did not see any substantial growth um, since 2015. Any growth was just pure, um, you know, the government printing more money and. Um, People take on more debt. Local government take on more debt to to fuel, you know, infrastructure projects or real estate projects. I mean, they're not real GDP pro pro productivity involved. So China's economy really did not grow s since 2015. That's just that's just my um, my um, estimate. So I think China's GDP is somewhere between 10 to 12 trillion dollars if you know if that assumption is true um, so again you know it's overstated right um, and then second of all its economy did not grow uh, since 2015 uh, it should absolutely not be higher than 20 than than 2019 so so China, so China's GDP is, let's say, if it's at eleven trillion dollars, which is at the twenty fifteen level. Um, now that's the question: is will India catch up with that in in some time? Right. Still, that's you know that's doubling. That's twice as much as Japan's GDP. Now, the other problem with China's economy, because we cannot just look at, this is kind of the mindset that the CCP has kind of instilled in, 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 in the minds of the world's people. Somehow everyone becomes so obsessed with GDP because the CCP does. But that's not a good indication of a, country, of a country's uh, economic strength right, or national strength. Because if you look at China's population, um, the former 
Premier Li Keqiang said, 60, no, 600 million Chinese um, have a monthly income of $150 or less. And that's extreme poverty, even by Chinese standard. And that was when he, he said this, what, three years ago. Now, I think more people are getting poor. So more people um, are, have lost money. So you have more than 600 million people live um, with less than uh, 1,000 yuan or $150 or less. So as more Chinese suffer from poverty now, um, how can you argue that how can you argue that China deserved to be the second largest economy when 50% of its population is dirt poor? Um, even if you do, it's not that country is not socially stable because when half of the people can barely survive and are living with resentment, you cannot claim that that country is the second largest economy. It's only the second largest on paper. And this calculation is, is not even being verified. It's just, just because CCP released its GDP saying that they're at 17 trillion. But if you look at you know, the, the, the wealth distribution of the country, it spells problems all over. So over the long run, I think as long as the CCP and Xi Jinping continue to rule China and push China into this, um, this corner of common prosperity or common poverty, its economy will shrink, uh, will shrink, <laughs> sorry, will shrink. And um, so it will go down and India will go up. Um, so I still think India has a great potential to become the second largest economy in the world because of that and because of the problem that China has, but also because of uh, five clear advantages that India has over China. Um, so I'm going to talk about the five advantages that India has. First, the Indian economy has a clear strategic advantage when its workforce um, is considered, if you look at its workforce. India's young population provides the country with a demo demographic advantage over China. And not only the average age of the country is 10, year, 10 years younger, it has a huge, extremely skilled workforce. With a young population, India has a human resource advantage in the global labor market. Um, there's a scholar, his name is, I hope I could pronounce it, his, it may be a she, it's her name, his name is Shudi Ra, Rajagopalan. It's an Indian name. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. I'm not very good at pronouncing names. Um, I get scared when I have to pronounce people's name. So he's a, or she is a senior researcher and economist at George Mason University. And, and this, this um, scholar said that India will become the world's largest talent pool. And it makes sense to me because I the Indian education system was created by the British and they can speak fluent English, which gives them an edge over the Chinese who face language barriers. Um, China claims that its labor force is highly educated because uh, the Ministry of Education claimed that 240 million people in China receive higher education. And the average years of education for new labor force reached 13.4 years. Now, I talked about this in my Saturday's program. Uh, right now, the college grad, the, the young people in China have a serious problem of, of finding a job. The employment rate in China, in Shanghai, uh, for college grad was only 32%. Uh, that means unemployment rate is at 68% in Shanghai, the most pop prosperous and industrialized city in China. You have, you know, almost two thirds of the college grads not able to find, uh, find a job. And so because of this, half of the young, half of the college grads chose to go to uh, graduate school. So because of its poor job market, young people choose to continue to go to school and the school encourages that um, because they can make, make more money. So 
so there's like an inflation of of degrees in China. Like um, college, a bachelor's degree is like a high school degree, and then the master's degree is is becoming like um, uh, like a college degree, right? And then the PhD is becoming a master's. So the fact that students stay in school longer doesn't mean they are more competitive in the job market, or at least not in the global labor market, or that, that that doesn't necessarily mean that they have learned the right skills, right, for their job. And that, in fact, is a problem. And, and because there's a disconnect between China's school, China's education system, and its workforce. Also, academic corruption is an epidemic plaguing Chinese education system and has prevented young people from getting a proper education. I made a video on that last year. And that's why China is suffering from a severe drought in, its, um, in, in some of its basic science and um, in some high-tech areas. So in the global industrial supply chains, Chinese workforce mainly does menial jobs on the factory shop floors, right? The low-end <clears throat> labor-intensive um, <clears throat> menial jobs. However, the Indian workforce does the high-end jobs um, <clears throat> for the IT and pharmaceutical industries. Those, those are what we know. India is also a major player in the business process outsourcing sector. Uh, the future of the world lies in high-skilled jobs. I think India's quality workforce will rise in prominence um, while the Chinese workforce will become obsolete as, the, um, as more manufacturing jobs are, are being moved to Southeast Asia and India. So in terms of demographics, India has an advantage over China in both the size of its younger workforce and also the quality of its workforce in terms of education. So that's um, India's advantage, number one. And number two is um, in the economic model. So in contrast to China's export-dependent economy, India's economic structure uh, is more balanced. In terms of, uh, in terms of GDP composition, Ch India's uh, proportion of domestic consumption is much higher than that of China. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, with personal consumption accounting to almost two thirds of China's of India's GDP, and it's higher than um, any other Asian countries, and definitely higher than China. So in 2022, China's personal consumption contributed um, only to a third of its GDP. So while India is twice as much, and India's manufacturing industry is relatively underdeveloped. So as supply chains are moving away from China to India, this gives the country a growth op opportunity um, for its young workforce. Um, and also different from China's, uh, I shouldn't say also, basically different from China's export-oriented, investment-driven approach. Um, I want to show you, there's a, there's a chart I prepared, maybe it's the next one. Yeah, this is a population projection by 2050 between China and in India. You see how, um, uh, yeah, it's China is all, it's older people is the majority of the country where India is the opposite, right? That, yeah. Um, this is the, um, the comparison of the GDP growth but I haven't, I haven't been able to update it since 2017, but that at least give you a view um, that the India's GDP growth has overtaken China since 2014. Yeah. If you really look at China's GDP growth, it has been on the decline since 2010. Uh, that, that just tells you its economy has been declining since then. Its labor force started to decline. Its GDP growth has been declining. It's just, it has been on a downward trend. Um, this is the uh, GDP growth projection by a Spanish research company, economic research company. Um, <clears throat> so the dip was during the pandemic in 2020, and then both countries rebounded in 2021, and then India will overtake China, India is blue and China is red. So that's just one, one projection. Um, 
by one organization. And I think this is a very, I think these, com- these organizations, have, if they, I think they try to, these graphs are politically correct, you know. <laughs> so um, anyways, that's just, that's just one graph. Uh, what I want to show you is this. This shows the percentage of, uh, of ca- the capital investment, I mean, the, to, to its GDP. You know how China, the capital investment has a much higher percentage um, uh, in China. Excuse me. I need to take a sip of water. Sorry. <clears throat> so a lot of the Chinese GDP is just capital, what I call capital maneuver, right? Money in the capital market, money in the financial market, um, money being leveraged, highly leveraged um, to create some uh, growth on paper, but the, it's, it does not involve the real economy. So, so that's that. That this this graph, you know, is very telling um, about the <clears throat> the the composition of the the economic model. So, so so different from China's export oriented and investment driven approach, which relies on government directed urbanization initiatives to promote GDP growth and infra- infrastructure industrialization, right? Most of the GDP growth came from um, government-directed urbanization project or uh, G- uh, infrastructure industrialization. India's economic development model is service-oriented. It's driven by domestic demand and moves more organically from an agricultural society to an industrial society. So its growth is, is more balanced, it's more organic, and, and it's healthier, it's balanced. Um, so I think this is a very, very, very important, it's sustainable. Um, and this is a very important advantage that India has. The third advantage is something that I think bothers Xi Jinping very much. <laughs> India is self-sufficient in food. Um, and both countries have the same amount of population. Let's assume they do. I think India has, I, I don't think China has 1.4 billion people. Um, I think has much less than 1.4 billion, but let's just say they have the same amount of people, right? Um, so food is feeding 1.4 billion people is, is challenging. Um, so like the Chinese, rice is a stable food for Indians. India is the world's largest exporter of rice with an annual production of 130 million metric tons. China is the largest rice importer. In other words, after feeding its 1.4 billion people, India uh, is still able to manage to rank number one in rice exports. Although China claims to be the largest rice producer in the world, producing 148 million metric tons of rice a year, um, 148 versus India's 130 million metric tons. It's China imports a lot of rice. So there's something that doesn't make sense here. I don't know if you realize that. If China and India have the same population and China produces so much more rice than India, why does China still need to import rice to feed its people? Why India, producing less, has plenty left over to export? That doesn't make sense to me. That just tells us the rice production China claims it has is bogus. There's no way China produces 148 million metric tons of rice. It does not produce more than uh, what India produces. It, it just does not want to show the world how sad its agriculture has, has become. Um, so there's no way that number is real. Uh, by the way, the CCP is now very concerned with its lack of ability to feed its people. The, disappear- the disappearing farmland and the lack of farm labor are both threatening China's agriculture. 
on top of bad policies. It recently just launched a campaign to turn forest and residential land and other land into farmland. I actually have a have a picture to show you. I thought it was it's really um, funny. I want to hear. <laughs> if you read Chinese, you should, you should you should laugh. It says, "No import of grains from from foreign countries. Uh, please hurry up to uh, to harvest uh, to 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 go harvest rice or something to yeah whatever to go plant more." Uh, uh, to, more rice. Basically, the the reason is there's no no more imports, um, or we can't expect more rice import imports or grain imports from from foreign countries. So China, you know, I mean, this is putting is a, this is a banner probably somewhere in the countryside. So China is now launching a campaign to turn forests and residential land into farmland, completely reversing its own policy a few years ago. To, to turn farmland into forests and urban areas. This just, this just shows you how desperate the central government is. Um, whereas in, in, in India, last year when food prices soared after the war in Ukraine broke out, Indian Prime Minister Modi declared that India not only has enough food to feed its people, but also uh, was, was ready to deliver food to other parts of the world. So, being the largest country and being able to feed its people um, is a great strategic advantage India has over China. Um, yeah. Number four, Indian citizens enjoy better, let me come back, better social programs such as universal health care, free universal health care. After spending a gigantic amount of money on zero COVID, China currently cut Medicare benefits for retirees, uh, which caused a white hair movement by the elderly people. Remember the protests that we've seen in, in winter? The CCP always uses China's large population as an excuse for its lack of uh, money to spend on its citizens. India, however, you know, has more people but is able to offer free universal health care to its 1.4 billion citizens. And the constitution of India states that the government is to, uh, has the responsibility to ensure the right to health for all. Um, I heard that, I, I, I don't know if this is true, I heard that patients in India receives a daily nutrition subsidy equivalent to like 10 US dollars a day if they're hospitalized. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it sounds very generous. If that happens in China, I think people will be very happy. Um, there's a story about how India is able to afford uh, offering great medical benefits to its large population. So in 1995, when India joined the WTO and uh, the country negotiated with the organization, uh, but to protect its then 800 million population, the Indian government proposed something that's shocking to the WTO. The Indian government want to have access to the expensive and the latest drugs developed by the West. Um, the, India wants to ob obtain licenses and produce them for their uh, for the for domestic use, because the country has a large poor population who are not able to afford the drugs. So at first, the Western countries disagreed, and they argued that doing so will violate the principles of equal trade. But India persisted, and in the end, they came up with the, the both sides came up with a solution. WTO allowed India to apply the WTO relief mechanism, basically allowed India to make generic drugs. Um, for domestic use in India without having to pay a high license fee. But India is not allowed to export the drugs to other countries. Um, in, you see, Indian government fought for its people and the CCP doesn't. Uh, that's why there was a movie made in China about some Chinese leukemia patients smuggling Indian-made drugs into China to save their lives. Uh, these drugs are available to Indian patients at m minimum cost or no cost. I'm not sure how much it actually costs, but Chinese don't have 
<laughs> Chinese don't have a government that works for them. So uh, this is very important because, uh, you know, when you have such a so such a large population, you know, being able to offer your citizen a good, you know, healthcare program, um, you know, it's it's a is an indicator of how stable the country is. Um, the last advantage India has is it's the largest democratic country and has a, a government that's uh, more effective or cost effective, shall we say. India is a country with different ethnic groups and numerous religious sects. It has held 16 presidential elections since 1952. Citizens can vote. This is something the Chinese people cannot even think of, think about, right? And also Indian government um, the, the two government spending priorities are different. So, for example, from for the 2022 to 2023 fiscal year, China has China and India have the same population for the sake of the arguments. India's fiscal revenue is about 500 billion U.S. dollars or half of a trillion of U.S. dollars. China's fiscal revenue is six times at three trillion U.S. dollars. But India is able to pay for the universal health health care benefits for its 1.4 billion people. China pays for the free health care for CCP officials, but not its 1.4 billion citizens, or not even 1.4, probably 1.2, or even 1 billion citizens. Does that tell us? At, at six times more fiscal revenue, this is the government, the government um, tax revenue, doesn't that tell us which government is more efficient, right? Or, or has the advantage over the other? Some people say India is poorer than China. A lot of people have this perception. So for example, I've seen Chinese saying that India is so poor that there's no air conditioning in the Ministry of Defense building when the temperature in New Delhi in the summer can exceed 40 degrees um, Celsius. I don't know if that's true, but I won't be surprised at all if some Indian officials work from some crappy office buildings when the CCP officials have the most luxurious office buildings in town. The difference is Indian government needs taxpayers' approval to spend money, and, and there's no public money for dining and whining, while the CCP takes public money and treat it as their own pocket money. And that's why... Indian citizens have enjoyed free health care for 63 years, while Ch the Chinese don't. It's not an issue of wealth. Uh, it's a matter of priority. So on that note, I think India has um, absolute advantage over China, as long as the CCP is in power. So all of the five advantages um, that I mentioned <clears throat> uh, that, that India has, are exactly the problems that are wreaking havoc in China right now, right? The problems with the young people not getting a job um, and the problem of elderly people not getting medi medical, medical benefits, the corruption of the officials, the wasteful spending of the government money, the declining agricultural and, and the food dependency, and the, and, and the, and the fatal problem of its economic model, right? The, the pursuit of GDP at the cost of everything else. So for these reasons, I say at some point, uh, people will assume that India is the second largest economy in the world, even though CCP can claim its GDP at whatever number um, it has. Because as soon as people on a large scale to, to start talk about all the economic problems that China has, which it's trying to hiding, it's trying to hide. Um, when people on a large scale are talk, are talk will be talking about the, the, the collapse of the Chinese economy, they no longer care about its GDP because it's it, 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 it's not no longer relevant. Um, and at that moment, whether China's what whether China holds a second place um, in terms of GDP, I think is is um, is um, is a non-issue. Um, does not interest people anymore. When that happens, 
India will legitimately become the second largest economy um, in the world. So <clears throat> hopefully I have presented a case. Um, of course, this may take a long time. I'm not saying that it's going to happen over time. It, it will take a long time, but, but definitely I feel very strongly about the five advantages that India has over China. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident in my assessment. All right, let's see if people have questions for me. Do I have slides I haven't shared with you? Oh, that's it. Yeah, I think I've shared every slide. Yep. Okay, let me see if people have questions for me. Let me address the, the super chats. All right. Thank you, Rob Hockey. Does China ever accept immigrant to bolster the population? No, China is very... China is very skeptical. China is not an immigration country. No, unfortunately. Um, and let me see in the next super chat questions. From Pablo Skates, if China gets desperate and starts taking money from citizen bank accounts, do you think they will raid Hong Kong bank accounts too? I think it will be more careful with Hong Kong because it needs Hong Kong um, to, to function at its front as an interface with the rest of the world. It's trying to tighten its control internally without changing the facade that it's a, demo, a free economic zone because it does need Hong Kong as, you know, uh, to function as, as the interface with the rest of the world. Uh, so it will be careful. Um, let me see. All right. Uh, I think that seems to be all the super chat questions. Let me see if people have, have questions for me. I don't see, a, um, for a Mario Nakula, Nakula. <laughs> Having me pronounce your names is a challenge. Lei, given your statements and assessment of China's real economy, do you think that this will influence China's intention to invade Taiwan? Yes, well, I, I read that someone said that one of China's in, uh, incentive to invade Taiwan is uh, it will include Taiwan's GDP to its total so that it, it can claim that it's the largest economy in the world overtaking Taiwan. I mean, overtaking the United States. I think the CCP is so obsessed with GDP. I, I think though some of the whole world's economists have follow, followed them into that trap. I mean, GDP is not, I mean, we, 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 well, the US GDP is at what, $24 trillion? China is 17. Before the pandemic, it, it was at 14. So when it reached 17, it got very excited. It thinks that it can, it's, it's getting closer to, closer to the US and it will eventually um, overtake the United States in its, in its GDP. Um, I don't know. I don't know how many people actually believe that. Um, let me see. From uh, from this gentleman, I'm sorry I cannot pronounce your name, but um, Lei, with the information from China is so sketchy, it is rather difficult to make any assertions. Don't you think so? It is true. The information from China is very sketchy. Um, uh, I think if we don't see the risk of the risk of not making any assertions is that by default, the rest of the world would accept CCP's numbers because the whole the, you have armies of economists and analysts doing their work based on the official numbers from China, which we know are not correct. You know, I think it's really pathetic that you have these people dedicate their life their, to to. To, to analyze China's fictitious numbers. So if we don't try to make some assertions, then 
all of their work is is a waste of time. So as difficult as it is, we must make some assertions. We must do everything we can um, using unconventional ways to, to, to analyze, to, to ask questions. Maybe we do not have the answer, but at least we should ask enough questions to challenge the official Chinese number. Because if we don't do anything, I know, um, you know, for a, uh, for a professionally trained financial analyst, you know, sometimes you become very scared when you make an assertion, when you make assumptions, because you say, well, how do you prove that, right? You don't have proofs. We don't have proofs because the CCP controls the data or the CCP doesn't, you know, does not even have good numbers because they cook the books from at the very grassroots level. So there's no good numbers whatsoever in China in terms of the, the, the financial statements. So what do you do? Um, you still, we, it, to be responsible for our economy, for our investments, and for, uh, to, to be responsible to, to, to our societies, we have to make some assertions. We have to try. At the risk of ruining my reputation, I still have to try. Because if I don't try, if I don't even try to do that, if I don't even try to challenge the number or uh, make people think, and ask questions, then by default, if we don't do anything, then we, by default, we have already accepted CCP's narratives and numbers, and that's dangerous, and that's wrong. Um, I didn't realize that until very recently, because as professionals, we're all very attached to our reputation. We would rather stick to a set of wrong numbers when we can back them up, when we can back up the sources. That we would rather do that. We would rather stick to the wrong assumptions because we have sources than presenting more accurate numbers that we cannot back up. And that, to me, is wrong. I didn't realize that last year, but this year I realized that. Because we're too attached to our reputation. But what when we're all wrong, when this profession, when the whole world cannot figure out what's going on with China's GDP, with China's economy, then what's the point of we're all right or wrong? We're all wrong. Nobody is right. So I think at this point, at some, at some point I figured, I said, it does, it does not matter whether people say I'm right or wrong or when people challenge, well, where's your sources? I'll let you know my thinking. I'll let you know my logic. Um, but I need to be the one who asks that question because no one is, or not a lot of people are doing that, right? So, so I think that's, that's my thinking. But that's a great question. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, so let me see. Alan Mendel. Lay, are India's economic data reliable? Um, that's a good question. I have already noticed that it's uh, India's India's GDP number is different from other sources. I've seen like various versions of India's GDP data, and um, remember that chart that compares India's GDP growth to China's. I was trying to. I already up, try to update the chart to show the recent one. And I realized there are different sets of numbers and I can't use them. You, 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 I would be comparing. So I, I would rather use a chart um, that's only updated as of 2017 than updating it to, to current, but using different numbers because the trend would be off. But <clears throat> that's a very good question. That's why I did not present my argument based on uh, quantitative uh, analysis or assertions. It's more of qualitative. My my uh, analysis of India's advantage is more qualitative than quantitative, precisely because of that, or because I don't have enough information to make a uh, a quantitative uh, analysis. Uh, from J one 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 one, Hele, are the Chinese being sent back? The countryside has lots of friends 
had lots of friends who keep talking about nature and countryside. Seems like CCP propaganda. They're trying to send the young people back to the countryside to help with the agriculture. It's almost similar to what Mao did during the Cultural Revolution, right? S send the young people to the... You have such urban youth who can't find a job, and then you have you have agriculture, farmlanding in, in, in the countryside that don't have uh, people. So they're trying to, at a macro level, reshuffle the country's ma uh, labor force. It's, it's mind boggling to think how a, a communist state do that. So for example, um, they realize that they need people, labor in the countryside to, 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 to take care of agriculture, right? You have, I don't know, uh, 150 million in hundreds of, I think probably 150 million, uh, uh, no mingo, what do you call that? Peasant workers. They're peasants. Uh, they're from the countryside, but they, they moved to the urban area to do the low end jobs like construction workers, right? Work, labor work works. And so the, the government is it just passed a, a, a policy to say, any man over the age of 60, I think it's 60 for men and 55 for women, uh, they cannot do that job. They have to, they, they, they cannot. So this will effectively send many older uh, laborers from the countryside who are now in the city, to force them back to the countryside. And when they, when they move back, they will vacant some jobs for the young people in the urban area. Uh, so they're trying to fill those laborers' job um, with the, the urban youth because you have the problem of all these young people not finding a job. Um, so the government is doing that through policies, you know, and I, I was just thinking you, you would never see anything like that in, in a Western country, you know, by moving. So, um, but I don't know how effective that will be, you know. Um, even I think when these people go back to the countryside, will they be happy to be a farmer? I mean, they haven't been working as a farmer for decades. I mean, if they're 60 years old or 65 years old, they've worked in the, on the construction, construction site for, for 30 years. Um, when they go back, I don't think they're going to go do farming all of a sudden, right? So you can't force people to do what they don't want to do, or the, maybe they've already lost the skills. So, yeah, so but but they're they're issuing these policies to move people, mass amount of people, um, around the country, uh, and I thought that's mind-boggling. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me see if any other questions for me. All right, so I'm at the bottom of um, the questions from Len uh, Lay Indian caste systems might impede its economic development or not that's that's a very good point yes yeah these are the 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 nuances unique to to india um uh, but china also have its have it also has its problem too so like the, it, it's a different problem but similar that's a good point um all right, so if that's all, I will end it here. Oh, uh, from Silas Larson. In the USA in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, workers were taken in programs to build dams and, and trails and roads. Uh, yes. In the 1930s, during the uh, Great Depression, I, <clears throat> I heard that, I mean, the government provided provided food um the government controlled the food supplies so at least people were able to have food um yeah so that that's a good point thank you from sir humphrey uh highlighting the highlighting the forces at work affecting the future world yeah I think India and China are both the two important countries um, in the future. So it's they worth, a, we need to have a discussion on, on that. All right. So without any, oh, from, 
from Ed C. Why is India so anxious to join China in the BRICS currency? I'm not so sure if India is so anxious. Uh, the BRICS is controlled by China and and Russia. Um, I think uh, we'll we'll have to see how how India reacts to that. Sometimes I think in geopolitics, there are a lot of talks. <laughs> so you know, people talk about that. So we'll see. All right. So thank you, everyone. Um, the program, okay, from the program to build dams and trails and roads were voluntary. Yeah, that's that. There's a difference in a communist country. It's it's government forced. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, J one 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 one. I appreciate the donation and thank you everyone for joining me. I hope this is helpful, and I'll see you later. Okay, enjoy the rest of the week. Bye bye. Bye.